Hello again, thank you for taking your seats. So indeed, roaming charges are no longer to be paid by all European consumers who travel within the European Union as of today. Let me call again upon uh, Vice President Ansip, if he cares to join me on stage. If you would kindly sit. So, no roaming charges as long as we European citizens travel. Because, of course, if we stay home and call from home with our mobile to somebody else in any other European country, then, of course, we still pay an extra charge. But when we uh, will stay at home and uh, will call to our family members who will travel in uh, other EU member states, uh, then our family members, uh, they don't have to pay for those received calls. That's right. And it's beneficial anyway. And non-family members? Uh, non-family members, uh, uh, you can call even me, uh, no room charges anymore. Okay. So, but uh, when but that's because you are a very, a very big guy in Europe. Ah. Uh, it's it's so for everybody, as we all know. <laughs> but uh, but if people they will uh, call to some other people uh, from uh, uh, other countries, then uh, yes, they have to pay uh, for long distance calls, mm -hmm. uh, but. Um, this proposal to deal with those uh, prices also on the level of the European Union was made by the European Commission in the year 2013. But then it was rejected by the Parliament 2014. And today, I think maybe it was even correct. Because uh, when we're talking about long distance calls, then we're talking somehow about our past. Right. Today, even according to a Digital Economy and Society Index, this ranking list, uh, we, are, we are talking also about video calls, for example. More and more people uh, in the European Union, in all the member states, uh, they prefer to use video calls. But uh, video calls, it means mainly uh, Skype, uh, FaceTime, WhatsApp, mm -hmm. uh, uh, other the solutions and uh, it means over the internet uh, it's uh, it's practically free of charge free of if charge. you paid already for the internet then phone call is free of charge and uh, uh, my daughter for example said that um, uh, thanks to those uh, facetime calls uh, thanks to video calls um, uh, she does not uh, have a feeling that father is uh, somewhere away uh, not at home mm -hmm. so so it it's free of charge and, and, and beneficial uh, in comparison with the roaming surcharges, uh, people, they have an option. Right. Now, of course, one of the constant criticisms about uh, the EU is that it's uh, not close enough to the citizens, doesn't uh, concern them as directly as it should, but with this uh, accomplishment as of today, uh, it shows that indeed the EU is useful to European consumers. The whole European Union is uh, useful for EU consumers, for our citizens, uh, uh, but of course, if um, uh, this decision is, is about uh, everybody, of all of us, you know, if you don't have to pay it uh, since today, uh, then uh, people, they're able to understand uh, that, uh, oh yes, uh, this European Union is dealing also with, with the beneficial and useful issues. But uh, when talking about 700 megahertz, uh, then uh, for some people it's, uh, it's pretty difficult to understand that it's um, also about their benefits. For Majority of people, maybe 700 megahertz is, is not 
so much uh, sexy topic, but uh, uh, but for you it is. For me, it's it's uh, even the most sexiest topic uh, in the world. <laughs> 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 because, okay, when talking about market value of this band, as you know, uh, we decided to divide to split into two parts of 700 megahertz band. Upper side will um, be up to uh, telecom operators. Um, for 5G and sub-700 bands will be up to digital terrestrial television, up to theaters using uh, wireless mics. Uh, so we were able to, to bring clarity in, in those 700 megahertz and uh, uh, 5G in the European Union. Without this clarity, it will stay as a, as a dream. So market value of this band is somewhere 11 billion euros, but influence on economical development will be much, much bigger than just those 11 billion uh, euros. So portability of the content. The next issue uh, where uh, all the people, they are able to understand that, that, that yes, EU is beneficial for us. Yesterday, they couldn't get access to their legally bought digital content when they used to spend their holidays here in, in Malta, for example. Next year, people, they can continue to watch their uh, favorite TV series, uh, uh, movies, listen music, uh, e-books, audiobooks, uh, sports events. So it will be possible, and I'm absolutely sure uh, people they will remember that uh, the European Union did it. And the European Union will continue to do, but of course there are still issues to be settled concerning copyrights, for instance, uh, which, where uh, the, the, the systems are quite different from one uh, member state to the other. Yes, I, uh, I agree with you. Uh, we already launched uh, uh, our copyright reform uh, proposal. One of those aims, according to our copyright proposal, is also to increase uh, uh, the volume of uh, content, uh, which will be digital content, which will be available cross-border to uh, our uh, citizens for two times. So, uh, once again, uh, for our people, um, it will be really beneficial because uh, today uh, I think all the people, they, they saw those notices. Sorry, this video is not available in your country. Not so nice message, but uh, I think all the people in this room, they experienced uh, uh, with this uh, uh, unjustified uh, geoblocking. But again, among the people in this room and, and much beyond, among all those who are following us uh, also on, on uh, all the social media and on the web, uh, they're not only consumers, uh, they, they are the business people, the telecom operators, all, the whole industry here in Europe, uh, wh which is of course concerned about your digital strategy uh, over, over the years. Uh, you said earlier that indeed democracy is slow, that the democratic process uh, through the European Parliament also to convince uh, national governments takes time. But uh, the tec I mean, technology never waits for anybody. And so there's that extraordinary acceleration. Um, what could be done in order to have more R&D centers here in Europe, uh, rather than uh, be in a way more and more dependent on what uh, the big American major companies do? At first, of course, we have to invest more. Too often, uh, our people say that, look, uh, in the United States, uh, they have Google and, uh, and Amazon and, and Facebook, uh, but we don't. But uh, when in the United States uh, they uh, decided to invest taxpayers' money in digital technologies, uh, uh, 10 billion uh, US dollars within five years, then in the European Union we used to deal with uh, 50,000 accused uh, projects. And it makes sense. 
So now, when talking about new technologies, then uh, we have to invest much more. And in many cases, uh, we have to say that uh, uh, single member states, uh, they are too small to deal with uh, some issues alone. I'm uh, really happy that uh, in Rome, uh, we were able to sign an agreement, now already eight member states, uh, uh, to cooperate uh, to build up uh, our own supercomputers, our new exascale uh, computers. If in bigger member states, they will be able to find those uh, couple of uh, uh, billions of uh, years, even five billion years uh, to build up uh, uh, new exascale computer, uh, uh, then for smaller member states it's practically impossible or also in financial meaning to, to deal with the supercomputers in this meaning. Uh, but even for bigger member states, the real question is from where to find those people who are able to, to build up those uh, uh, supercomputers. And today uh, the European Union is consuming uh, approximately 30% of uh, those global supercomputing capacities, but uh, we are able to provide just 5% mm -hmm. from those capacities. So we have to invest and then we can, uh, can hope uh, that uh, we will uh, get our own Facebooks and then Amazons and then Googles also. One last question. Uh, if I may, about these GAFA, what could be done in order to convince them to invest in Europe and have working centers in Europe and not only tax havens whenever they can, uh, so as to create added value here in Europe uh, with European jobs, so to speak, and European added value? And talking about um, uh, taxes, uh, then uh, for this uh, uh, commission is absolutely clear. Taxes, they have to, wait to be paid in those countries where uh, those companies are generating uh, their uh, profits. But when talking about global players, uh, then I would like to say that uh, um, some of them, uh, they made uh, really remarkable investments into Europe, European economy also. IBM Watson, for example, uh, in Munich. Great example uh, about uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, uh, in Europe uh, or in Milan, uh, health uh, data center, uh, once again, investment made by IBM, but, but I, I'm not here to promote uh, global players and their investments made into into European economy, but uh, this no, picture, but it's good but, uh, this picture it's is, good is not Europe. black and white. Uh, let's go look on, on Microsoft, uh, for example, and then their uh, really remarkable investments uh, they made into European economy. So uh, this picture is, uh, is not so black and white that uh, uh, those global players uh, uh, are paying taxes somewhere else or not paying at all. Uh, but anyway, not paying those taxes uh, uh, in the European Union or, or not making investments, uh, real investments uh, in the European Union. And this uh, uh, picture is, uh, is uh, becoming uh, more beautiful every day. Okay, well, let's look at a very beautiful picture that was shot in Malta today. All these happy European travelers uh, discovering that they don't have to pay any more roaming charges. That was shot by our crews today in Malta. We didn't know it. We got the message from our operator. And uh, it was like too good to be true. So we, uh, we had to call them to ask if it was really true. I'm going to update Facebook so much. <laughs> yes, it's awesome. We can surf and uh, call and do whatever we want, and it's no extra charges. No, 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 no. That's not real. It's very handy. We always.
always need the internet. And now that we have it. Vous en avez entendu parler en juin 2017 que les, le roaming data européen va être uniformisé pour payer moins cher. Ouais. Je ne suis pas spécialement pro-européen, mais ça c'est une bonne mesure. I think it's extremely high. Ya en realidad ya estoy llamando a mi madre, que llevo cinco días sin hablar con ella. A nosotros nos viene súper bien, supongo que a las compañías no. Es un puntazo porque a veces vas por ahí mendigando un sitio con wifi y quieras o no, en plan, el wifi pues, y el internet tiene un puntazo y después poder llamar también. Llamar a nuestra madre. Llamar a mi madre. ciudad que no estás te pierdes o, o hablar simplemente con tu familia allí y es una gran oportunidad. Next time I'm going to uh, travel with my kids. They can use their iPads and uh, I don't need to worry that it's uh, very expensive. I heard about it earlier. I'm going to turn my roaming on now. I can't wait. Ça veut dire qu'à partir de ce soir on va pas enfin on va pouvoir utiliser notre internet ici sans payer en plus. Je vais appeler mes potes pour leur raconter mes vacances. L'assenza di roaming e la libertà di uh, diciamo così comunicazione è una cosa bella perfetta. E per adesso ancora non ho visto. We had a very good deal with our operator and but it didn't cover all of Europe, only um, the Baltic countries and the Nordic countries. But of course here in Malta it, it is a better choice. C'est une super nouvelle. Parce que en général, moi je sais que je laisse mon téléphone coupé et ça me permettra de si jamais on a un souci ou qu'on a envie d'appeler quelqu'un, moi j'ai ma soeur à Barcelone, moi je pourrais l'appeler, donc c'est génial. Et bah aujourd'hui c'est mes 30 ans, donc comme ça bah, je vais pouvoir avoir euh, <rire> mes parents au téléphone et euh, mes amis, donc euh, c'est nickel. Bah, moi ça m'arrange, ça m'arrange déjà pour, si j'ai bah, si internet déjà, je peux avoir mon GPS, je peux faire mes recherches, Et surtout je suis pas très très organisée donc quand j'arrive dans le pays pour moi c'est une très très bonne nouvelle. Ah, c'est très 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 bien, ça c'est... Je sais qu'elle par exemple elle paye 2 euros par mois et elle a tout est limité, c'est le top. So now I can use my phone like I do back home. It's really nice. Yes, I was in fact looking forward to, to this day, yes. So, of course they were a bit more excited at night than they were in daytime, but still, all very happy. Let me now call our panelists for this afternoon session, starting with Roberto Viola, Director General DG Connect. Andrew Tony Camilleri of the Maltese Presidency of the EU, Mrs. Mia Petra Kumpula Natri, European Parliament, Mrs. Marlene Mitzi, also European Parliament, Sebastien Soriano, who chairs the BEREC, the body of Euro European regulation, electronic communication, c'est plus facile à dire en français. Uh, Monique Goyens, uh, Director General of the European Consumer Organization, and Christian Salbin, Board Member of GSMA, the Telecom Industry. Uh, I was looking at the, uh, some of the comments on the social media, and someone complained there was only one woman on stage for this uh, uh, occasion, so I'm very happy to welcome three ladies. And this afternoon, and so I hope whoever wasn't happy is now very happy. Roberto Viola, let me start with you. What, in your view, is the, the impact of the new roaming system going to be for the telecom industry? Wow. And the broader <laughs> digital market. Uh, we start with a big question, then we narrow it down. Well, today is a celebration day to start with. Uh, and what I want to say, first of all, it started with a terrifying SMS from my wife. She said, I switched on the phone, it doesn't work. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Then, actually, the operator she was uh, using solved the problem. 
and this allows me to say the first thing I want to say, a big thank you to GSMA and all the oper European operators. Yes, it was an achievement of the three institutions. Yes, it was an achievement uh, for all the national regulators, but there was a group that had to do it and work hard to do it because changing the systems and the billing system is not really like drinking a cup of tea. It's complicated and everyone really took this very, very seriously. So we have to be grateful because also there are not many sectors in Europe uh, which are contributing so much to the idea, and I'm slowly coming to the, the answer to your question, of uh, uh, a Europe that works without border. So thank you very much to the operator, thank you very much to GSMA for this work. Were, were all operators that nice, or some of them I were mean, a little bit more? The law, the law allowed to some operator not to be nice. Uh, so if an operator was suffering extra uh, uh, revenue loss above a certain margin, mm -hmm. uh, could have applied for a derogation. Now, in Europe, we have many operators with the network and thousands and thousands of virtual operators. Uh, I don't even know whether we know the overall number. Out of this gigantic number, only 36 operators in Europe applied for a derogation, and only 24 were given a derogation. So that means that hundreds of millions of Europeans today enjoy r no roaming. Mm -hmm. And you have seen the reactions. I mean, this is also this is a big thank you to, uh, uh, to Burke and the Consumer Association. I mean, the pressure that the citizens had on the institutions uh, really made the difference. And I think the institutions worked very hard. So my other thank you is to the European Parliament. And last but not least, I did it in my opening the Digital Assembly to the Maltese Presidency. So a teamwork where people really are almost in tears about being European. Is it beautiful? Yes. I feel really moved. But you pose a very serious question. What is next? I think what is next is now we have to make sure that this sector that we have touched is so important for all our citizens can deliver. And then the mission of this sector is not trivial at all. It's to connect everything in Europe, not single citizens, but also thermostats, uh, you, you, you imagine something dresses uh, to the network, no matter where, no matter uh, uh, how, but with high speed, uh, to make sure that then what is the change of we are going to witness of our society can be realized. Our estimation is that this little task will cost 500 billion, and these 500 billion are must be coming from private investment. So we need now to make sure that this private investment can flow in Europe, that operators and investors and shareholders of the operator believe that this is a place to invest. That's why now it's so important to have rules that give the certainty to operators that investing in Europe is a plus. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this is a great moment. This is a moment of celebration. And this is also something that I hope the operators will realize what it is, what they have seen. Because it's also a tremendous opportunity, I mean, for pushing for new services, new things. But then it's uh, up to us, the institution, now to reflect what next. And next is a set of rules, a set of proposals that will give the certainty to operators to invest. Uh, Mr. Camilleri, uh, there has been a lot of work, of course, to come to a compromise uh, for, for the maximum uh, wholesale roaming prices that uh, operators would pay to each other. Do you consider uh, this, uh, uh, the end of this process as a key success for the Maltese presidency? Uh, well, definitely, yes. Um, from our end, we always said that uh, this, this process was something which was quite vital for three different reasons for us. First and foremost, as our Prime Minister mentioned uh, earlier also in his keynote speech, this was one of the things that he had started himself as, a, as an MEP, so he was doing it from the European side. 
Then from a precedent point of view, in terms of the digital sector, we knew that this was vital for us to, to start off with a, with a bank in terms of uh, this was, uh, I believe, one of the priorities in terms of the DSM, in terms of what consumers wanted and what citizens wanted. And uh, from our end, for example, when, when we were doing our planning in this regard, we always kept in, in mind, you know, uh, what do the citizens want out there? What do the consumers want? And this one of those areas where we could easily, as we, see, as we also saw in the video, um, we could see that it was very easy for people to understand what we were talking about, you know? You, you, you go abroad, you switch on your phone, you don't have to pay extra charges. It was something very easy, and it was something direct, whether something maybe like the regulatory framework is something a bit more abstract in that regard in the minds of people. So definitely in that regard, it was quite important for us as well. But also from a, uh, a general political uh, level in terms of, the, uh, of our presidency, uh, this was our first trial that we closed in terms of our presence. So it was also important for us in, in, from a more tactical and say, point of view to, to make sure that we did quite well in order to start our presidency in a, on a good note and set the tone for the rest of our presidency in other areas as well. Um, just also maybe to uh, latch on to a point made by Roberto as well on the importance of this, and uh, especially when he mentioned the GSM and BEOC. I believe the main point that we had, I think, why we managed to get the success was that uh, in the room when we were discussing in the trialogues and the di bilaterals also at council level and also with the European Parliament, the question was not whether or not we should abolish roaming or not. So that question was decided. So everyone was on the same level, on the same page that we should arrive to this day today with this result. The question was the levels where we'll get, and that is something that it's up for discussion, mm -hmm. obviously, prob most probably everyone, not everyone in the room will be happy with what we have uh, arrived to in that, in that regard. But I think the ultimate goal was something which was uh, shared by everyone. So you don't have to spend time on the if, but we also spend all our time on the how to do it. Precisely. Let's turn to uh, the important role, obviously, that the European Parliament has played uh, in this process, starting with you, uh, Mrs. Kumpula Natri. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the, the cost of deploying uh, telecom networks vary very much from one member state to the other. So how, how did the negotiation process actually go? Thank you for the invitation. It's a good celebration tonight, and I'm also happy to see uh, important uh, stakeholders on, on this same uh, celebration. And a special thanks for the Maltese, because you didn't say it, I may say it, the countries were very divided, so it was a great job for the Maltese <laughs> presidency to wrap it up, so that they could be a good uh, negotiator partner, and then on the parliament side, it was strong will to push this through, uh, and we got it. I would call this like the modern people, modern European freedom of movement, because uh, literally, I would get lost. Uh, if we, I couldn't use the mobile data when I'm in another EU country, because now we can still use the, all the applications we, we, we have in our mobile. So, um, as I'm from Finland, and Finland tends to be the country with uses most data, mobile data in the world, or at least in Europe, uh, so we have really learned to use your mobile, where you are, where you need to go, what is your calendar, what is your healthy situation, what is your nutrition, or how many steps you're taking, all possible. Check your emails, update your Facebook. And then we went abroad. Did I exceed my monies, or how much would it cost to put a greetings from this conference to my work team or so this is like not to get lost and not to get disconnected and continue normal life so it will come more and more important for people that using the data is possible so the data part was most difficult one also and i even sense that during these late latest one year two years people were talking a lot on the phone calls and text messages and then uh, during this two years process, more and more people started to use more mobile data and then they started to talk about it. And of course, there was the difficulty of the price differences. And my big dream is that this will bring some transparency also for the uh, pricing. And I'm always happy to work with the mobile 
technology and mobile industry because that is the sector that is growing and booming. And once you invest more on the data infrastructure, the unit price will go down. First, first antenna is the most expensive. Then you put up more capacity, more capacity, and the unit price is not that uh, expensive anymore. So investments will be there, and then we will use more, more clients, more usage, and that will be good for everyone. But will it be more difficult for Nordic operators, as indeed the movement in the summer tends to be going from north to south, so there are more many more tourists coming from Scandinavian countries uh, to will, uh, the yeah. Mediterranean. So how does that affect? I will take that short because it's nice to be celebrating here and not to be back home. <laughs> because in <laughs> Finland, all four operators got the derogation, so they had a permission from the NRA to continue the roaming charges. Uh -huh. But the good news for my some fellow Finnish citizens here as well is that even they put the roaming price that will be 85% cheaper than yesterday. So that is always everywhere because the former cap was 50 euros per gigabit plus taxis and now it's 7.7 .7. in the 1st of January it will be only six so consumers win and that is also for operators time to adjust and uh, uh, get to this new phase yes it, it has been in the Nordics the prices were cheaper and then it's more difficult to pay high price when you travel for the Nordic operators or Baltic and some others in uh, Romania and others who were wishing for these uh, uh, lower prices. But at the same time, I think it's a good uh, example for countries that have been more expensive that why it has been more expensive. Uh, how do you think it will affect data consumption all over Europe? Do you think that eventually it will become even? from one country to the other? Nobody can uh, make me believe that it wouldn't grow everywhere, despite of roaming, but with roaming, you get to used to it at home and you can still continue a normal living and stay connected even when abroad. It will affect uh, positively even, even the appliances. So that is also the European SMEs, European companies that can create more services that you can use on your mobile data. Marlene Midzi, you are also a member of the European Parliament, a uh, member, a Maltese uh, member. Um, how will uh, consumers here in the island, but all over the unions, be protected? Will they be better protected thanks to these new roaming rules, in your view? Right, well, first of all, I would like to say I'm, it's a pleasure and an honor being here and hosting um, this, this very interesting conference. Because um, somehow there is a multi-stamp on this issue with our Prime Minister having started it back when he was an MEP, when he was also IMCO. Um, I was one of the negotiating team on IMCO as well. And um, it, this file was, was finalized under the, the presidency, which, which is uh, very satisfying, and now you're here in this in this, uh, this country, and I hope that the visitors will, will enjoy this beautiful country. So, to go back on your um, uh, question, as far as consumers are concerned, I think, I think consumers, it's a problem for them, because they used, to, they used to look forward to the exciting time when they open the telephone bills and they find those exciting, uh, huge bills, and that's, now they're going to miss it. So, but really, this is, this is something which touches everybody, because everybody is a consumer. And as the commissioner said before, uh, I think it was one of your very valid comments, was sometimes the consumers feel very far away from the European Union. They don't know what the European Union is there for. And this is an instance where they can really feel what it, feel, what it means to be members of the European Union. They can feel the benefits of what, what the European Union is all about. Because when you touch consumers, when you touch their, their rights, when you touch their pockets, that is, that is when they feel that they're having something. So yes, consumers, consumers are all of us. Um, we all have iPads, we all have phones. We all know how important those are. We all know how important the content and the, 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 the function of those devices are. Most of us would prefer to leave their wallets at home, but not their mobile at home. So we are highly dependent 
on the information that we get. We used to pay a lot for that. And now, wherever you go, 28 member states, it's Rome like at home. So uh, a lot of people, as you have seen from the, from the video, interesting video, some of them were surprised. They're like, call mommy now, you know, I can... Because for all of us, um, for most of us, for students, for a lot of people, it was an expensive exercise to actually communicate. And we can no longer, we can no longer make communication expensive for our citizens. So yes, this is a very satisfying day for, for us, for the European Union, for, for the presidency, for all of us here, for the consumers. Because yes, we've given something back to the consumers and they are protected. They are protected because there's, um, there's uh, an element of transparency. Um, providers are, are bound to inform what, um, what is going on with their, uh, with their fees, with their charges. So yes, I think the consumers are better off today than they were tomorrow. Uh, there's also, I mean, among European citizens, consumers, but citizens, a growing concern about uh, protection in terms of the data that they willingly or unwillingly uh, actually produce uh, in huge quantities. Do, do you feel that, again, in this new system, uh, there's more regulation involved, we'll come to that uh, in a moment, but is that another dimension of a citizen's protection? Well, data protection is always a very sensitive uh, topic. Um, uh, I don't think the fact that roaming charges have been abolished as from today, um, uh, the, 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 the problem of data protection is at all um, worse or better. I think consumers know that when they are online, um, they are bound to be giving information that they wouldn't want. They know that they are, they are also paying a price because um, providers are using that information even without their knowledge. Sure. But, but yes, that is something that we know. That is something in life, nothing is free. So, so, so we know, we have to know where our um, assets and liabilities are. So not, this is not perfect. This is not a perfect solution. Absolutely, there are pros and cons. And, and what, this, is, this is the start of, of getting, a, uh, getting somewhere. This is not the destination. So this is the start of actually giving a better service to our consumers, better protection, and better controls on whoever, on, on, and, and better, better uh, information by the stakeholders to everyone. So this is the start. It's not destination. Okay, let's now turn to the regulators. With you, uh, Sebastien Soriano, you, uh, you chair the French ARCEP in a very vigorous and proactive way, and I think you have the same uh, forward-looking approach when it comes to the European uh, telecom uh, market, I mean, at the European uh, level. Uh, what is actually the role of the national regulators in enforcing uh, the new rules? Yeah, first of all, thank you very much to the Maltese Presidency and to the European Commission for, for the invitation. Um, I would say that Berek is somewhere between a plumber and a policeman in this system. Actually, you know, with the consumer point of view, when you take the helicopter, this roaming like atom source story seems very simple. It's the same price than at home. But uh, when you, you look into details, it's a very complex story <laughs> because you have to make different operators work together and you have to look at tons of retail offers to make sure that this roam like atom principle is enforced for true. So I would say our role is very technical is very concrete, and we try to make sure that Rome Lac like Atom is not wishful thinking, but it's a sustainable reality as we are all experiencing today. So concretely, national regulators in every country are controlling the retail offer of the operator to make sure that they are respecting the roaming the Rome Lac like Atom principle. We are also looking at the possible exceptions, because you know that there are limited exceptions to make the whole possible, but under uh, very uh, defined conditions that we are looking uh, at. We can also fix possible 
disputes between operators in the system. So we are really an enabler, let's say, of uh, this very uh, political ambition. That is actually what is BEREC doing in all its fields, because you know we are from 20 years developing uh, competition in Europe. That was what the European institutions asked us to do. We are fostering net neutrality also. Uh, we are fostering this uh, roam like at home principle and hopefully we will in the future be um, in charge also of fostering um, gigabit society, 5G and investments as uh, mentioned by Robert Oviola. Do you find that the, the operators you, you deal with uh, on a daily basis uh, are, have understood that it's also in, in their interest uh, to play alongside these new European rules when it comes to their own development, their own uh, investments, how, however big they are. But after all, they did make some very good money for many years. Yes, actually, you know, the, the telecom sector is not, you don't have to look at it as a static sector. It's an ongoing dynamics. So what is important for that sector is that they have the ability and the visibility to invest in future networks. That is the important story. So in this roaming like at home uh, um, uh, regulatory process, what was important for the industry is to have previsibility and to have progressive steps. And I think that, you know, it's a 13 years process. So we can assume that the industry had uh, all the, the data to know where um, what was the direction of the EU, EU institutions. There were ve very many, many positive comments about uh, the European Commission and the European Parliament all over the European press today, so that's rare enough to be savoured, I guess. Uh, and, and in Les Echo, which is uh, our best uh, financial paper uh, in France, uh, there was an editorial saying, bravo to the Commission, uh, because uh, it's good to take care of consumers. But let's also uh, think of operators. And I would like uh, to ask Sebastian Sorano uh, what that, that editorial meant is that indeed uh, the EU should also favor, uh, if not concentration, but uh, certainly strengthening of major European operators so that they be able to play on the mm. worldwide scale. W would you subscribe to that? I guess it's a little bit the battle of yesterday. If you are really in a forward-looking approach, I think that, you know, Europe in the 90s was good in telecom, was good in telecom with this big uh, manufacturer especially. <laughs> but in the, in the last 15 years, let's say, Europe has been lagging behind. In the, in, about smartphones and about digital platforms. And today, all the tech giants are in Asia or in the United States. So the big issue for Europe is how do we make sure that we can be back in the tech scene? And it is, I mean, I fully respect telecom operators, I fully respect telecom manufacturers. But let's say there is a very few, very limited chance that internet giants, if we can hope to have internet giants in Europe, let's say they won't be telecom operator, they won't be telecom manufacturer. So the, the question is really, how do we make sure that we give all the chance to have tech giants in Europe? And in the telecom sector, this means internet of things. Internet of things is the really new wave of innovation. So on this particular uh, uh, subject, we have to really make sure that we are not, you know, over-regulating, inventing new rules. And uh, at BEREC level, we, we, we did this, uh, this forward-looking job. So several national authorities, like Ofcom in the UK, like RCEP in France, and the whole BEREC in Europe, we have been looking at all the telecom rules, and we have assumed that, that the rules were okay and that we didn't need any specific IoT regulation. And I think this is good for startups because they, they won't have specific rules, specific regulations, so they will have a real opportunity to grow and to give a, the possibility to Europe to be back in tech. And I think this is the big issue. Uh, Monique Goyans, we saw you 
not disapprove, but be skeptical about the idea that there shouldn't be more regulation or that indeed maybe less regulation to enable operators to indeed develop uh, added value technology. Uh, now that with this 15th of June, a uh, huge step uh, has uh, been a, a success. Uh, how do you see from, from the consumer's point of view do you really believe there should be more regulation in order to be sure that operators do not uh, try and twist the rules? Uh, thank you very much. Um, and I'm delighted to be here and to celebrate. Uh, just a little uh, um, uh, remark. When we speak about roaming and benefits for consumers, it's not just the students, it's not just the holidaymakers, it's also the businesses that travel and of the SMEs. Course. So it's not just the private sector that is benefiting, True. it's the whole economy. So this is a very important point. Uh, and I would also like to say huge respect to uh, the Commission, to the European Parliament, to the Council, because my organization was there since 2004. We have been seeing the marathon. You needed a lot of political will to resist a very reluctant industry to accept that a single market means no fragmentation anymore. So just that's your, your something neighbor that is nodding that it's a very powerful industry. As you belong to it. Well, Go ahead, Madame Goyas. We have 800 <laughs> members in the. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, the industry is not a block, but overall there was massive right. lobbying activity, and we have seen quite a, a huge toolbox being used uh, by the different representatives of the industry. And now, in terms of uh, regulation, yes, I think, I mean, roaming regulation is infecting, in fact addressing a market failure. If the market would have worked properly, there wouldn't have been any need to go into a price regulation. So there has been something that was abusive and that needs to be corrected. That's why we need uh, regulation. We believe when we look at what do we need, we need consumer trust. And we need that in the telecom area, all surveys are uh, totally in line. The telecom sector is one of the most complaint intensive sectors in Europe. That means that there is something wrong with this sector. Let me speak about international calls. And uh, with all respect I have for the huge work of Mr. Uh, Vice President Ansip, uh, I don't agree with him. Isn't it paradoxic that the person who travels pays less than the person who stays at home when giving a call? And Mr. Ansip told me once that he uh, paid all his kids an iPhone so that they can be on FaceTime. But not everybody can afford an iPhone. Not everybody has a broadband connection. Not everybody has the digital literacy to go uh, on Skype or on any other of the OTT services. So we believe that international calls is something that needs to be the next step in order to deliver trust for consumers. Now here it's about the single market. Second thing, even in domestic markets, there is a huge lack of compliance by telecom uh, operators uh, to, towards consumer expectations. Uh, you, do, you have an advertised speed of your internet connection, you don't get that speed, in fact, when you check it. Uh, the tariffs are very complex, they are not clear, it's very difficult to switch to vote with your feet. So this market is not functioning very well. So I believe that certainly regulatory intervention, not necessarily a new legislation, but certainly uh, close regulatory oversight is certainly that's something that consumers would welcome in this sector. Because it's all an issue of trust, of course, I mean, of confidence that indeed uh, people as well as businesses can count on such, uh, such a new system to actually uh, be respected. Yes, I mean, this is a question about uh, respect your partner and uh, to some extent uh, consumers and also speaking about data protection and changing topic there also, saying that people know what, they, what they're doing when they're online, the point, I mean, I could have two hours uh, to explain that that's not totally true, but also when you're on your app, you don't have the choice. You tick that you agree or you don't have the service. This is a captive situation. So this means that consumers, if they're not protected by uh, not only a good legislation, but a very strong enforcement, they are really uh, being uh, potentially ripped off by the, by the operators. Uh, Christian Salvin, uh, you belong to the telecom uh, industry. Uh, to, and we all know that, of course, it's an industry with many players, some much, much bigger than others, and it's an industry which requires huge investments. Uh, in your view, uh, is this uh, the way the EU is making progress in that score, it, does that offer new opportunities 
no. to the industry or on the contrary? Does it restrict no, no. its uh, development? No, on the contrary. I mean, it's, uh, it's a no-brainer. You know, I, uh, as some people around here know, I've been a proponent of uh, uh, free roaming and, and roam like home for over 10 years, 11 years. I think you, if you go on the internet, you'll find me testifying at a hearing of the European Parliament on this years and years ago. You know, the more freedom there is to use your mobile, the more you're going to use it. So it's a no-brainer. Why has there been this problem? I was happy to hear the vice president earlier on saying that we had an issue with legacy systems. You know, the, the way by in which uh, operators charge each other to host uh, the clients, uh, the customers of the other operator is inherited from the days of voice and text. So why has this taken so long? Uh, is that to find the right solution. And I'm very happy to say that there has been excellent cooperation between the industry representatives, the commission and the parliament to actually find the right solution. As you said, it was not if, it was how do we do it best. Now, to be frank, some of the regulations were not suited for purpose at certain times, but I think we've now reached the formula. If I can, just for personal satisfaction, show you a document which I, our company sent uh, 10 years ago to every single member of parliament saying, with the maps of Europe and mobile phones drawing uh, uh, the, the maps and with data roaming being the problem. So it has taken 10 years, but I am personally very satisfied that we, the company that invented uh, Feel Like Home and Roam Like Home, finally got through with everyone else. But for the industry, it's a no-brainer. You know, if our customers are able to, to use their mobile at any time, yes, it will increase usage. Okay? and it will increase the level of confidence. I would disagree with you in your characterization of how we deal with our customers. We're extremely concerned about the well-being of our customers. We are extremely concerned about the perception of our customers, of our services. Okay? And I think that is part of the competi competition between operators, is to make sure that we offer better services, uh, better packages, better prices. So there is no issue there. There's obviously a loss of revenue for operators yes. in Europe with this uh, new uh, free of charge roaming system. So how do they compensate? Have they already started to compensate? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we we put the... Uh, it's always good to know. Well, you know, right? basically, uh, it depends, you know, the debate we've had with the commission is where do you set the underlying wholesale rate? I don't want to get too technical, but there is a cost of providing the service, even if it's free to the customers. Now, the commission has set a certain cap. That cap at the moment stands at 7.5 euros per gigabyte. Now, in some countries, France in particular, you will have uh, many operators offering uh, the same gigabyte for two uh, at retail. So there is obviously an issue, and, and the reason why the Commission has enacted uh, a fair use of policies is to deal with these problems. I think this is going to be worked out over time, okay? But clearly, uh, for operators, we have to be able to uh, cover our investments, and we have to have uh, the ability to invest in the next generation. So Roberto talked about the investments around 5G. Uh, what does that mean? It means for the operators, first of all, securing the spectrum that they need to be able to develop these things, okay? And to be able to build a business case so that their investors will continue to put money into this. You know, it's, it's a fact that some people prefer to invest in other sectors than telecoms because they don't see the returns on investment in telecoms that they can see in other areas. Uh, looking at the, um, the, the American scene, uh, there's only a handful of operators and it seems that uh, the current administration would be more open indeed than the precedent one to more concentration. In, in Europe, we have a hundred. Yes. Would do you think that uh, it's, uh, it weakens mm -hmm. uh, the European no, uh, status no. compared to the competition? Should I, there I, be more it depends concentration? Which, which, you know, where you're looking, okay? I, I think uh, from our company perspective, you know, the, the, pre the preeminent is competition, providing the right service. So clearly the European model has allowed a very competitive environment and very low prices. It's, every, it's well known that prices in Europe are lower than in North America, for example. So competition from that point of view has worked. The question is how many operators are required in each individual market, because we still, from that point of view, in Europe, uh, operate market by market. What is the optimum number of operators? 
operators in each market to ensure the right level of competition and the right returns on investment. This is a still an open question, which perhaps my colleague <laughs> from France might want to say a few things about. I'd love to inject some questions into this uh, discussion, but somehow uh, I don't have any return on my screens here. So uh, all I can see back here, it's all sorts of compliments to you all for what you have said. Um, so let me turn back to you, unless the system works again, and I can have some, uh, some of the questions. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, uh, have put through the Slido uh, system, but for the time being, I've got nothing on these th screens. Uh, Roberto Viola, reacting to what uh, our uh, panelists have said, um, do you view uh, the, the regulating side uh, as uh, becoming uh, more and more uh, important in, in the coming years, as indeed, as uh, Vice President Ansip stressed uh, all along this afternoon, there will be very important uh, steps taken, um, 2018 and, and so on and so forth. There will be more and more uh, um, implementation of the European digital strategy? Well, the, uh, there will be a paradox, uh, which is uh, to do, to step into less regulation, we need more regulation. Uh, the digital single market means to have uh, common rules for many things we do, and that means uh, stepping in with European regulation. Uh, so you have seen a wave of proposals from the European Commission in the area of telecom, in the area of audiovisual, in the area of copyright, in the area of, uh, of e-commerce. And the reason is to make sure that we have common rules. So now we have uh, quite a task. Uh, Maltese presidents have done an exceptional job, as we all said. But uh, now they pass the testimony to the Bulgarian presidency. And the parliament, ourselves, and the new presidency still uh, will have to continue completing this reform of the rules. By the way, there's one thing that still the Maltese presidency can do, and uh, the rapporteur for the parliament is here, is Rosa Thun, is to close an agreement on unjustified geo-blocking. People hate to be blocked when they buy online. They cannot understand why in Europe you have this kind of uh, I don't ship it to your, I don't sell it to you even. That's, I mean, the telecom industry now, today, is a true European industry. Now we have to do the next step. We are that close, and I'm sure that the Maltese presidency, as I said, they are courageous and resilient uh, uh, people. Uh, I'm sure they can do the last step. So, uh, if we have uh, no roaming, uh, portability of content, uh, no blocking uh, when you buy, we will have realized in the term of this parliament uh, a Europe without digital borders. I think this is very important. And then, of course, we have to complete the uh, regulation for telecom, which we hope that in the next few months this will be possible. And in this, I have really to thank Perec for all the work the regulators are doing to help to have a, a, a constructive dialogue in this respect. So I'm an optimist by nature, but I'm three times more optimist today because of no roaming, because of portability, maybe because of no geo-blocking. Mr. Kumpulenetri. I must say that during this uh, process of the roaming and, and really thinking that what does it mean to digital single market and the European membership, I have had maybe most uh, contacts from abroad from UK because uh, after Brexit they are thinking, the U uh, UK citizens, that what will happen for roaming after. I'm not to say, but what I find out in the internet that my existing teleoperator contracts, I have two of them because I live in Brussels and Finland, so two mobiles, and so that traveling outside of EU for Finland, a, a Finnish person, Croatia, and Serbia, they are both quite exotic, but the one is member state and one is not. So using one giga in Serbia or using one in a member country, Croatia, 
Croatia will be zero euros for me now, and then Serbia, 9,000 euros. Oof. <laughs> you can check your own. And that's the, for the Beuk and others also. You really have to know which countries are your uh, domestic markets. And uh, that now concerns not also the citizens, not only once you cross the border, but is it an EU country or e, uh, European economic area country, like Norway is included, but go to Switzerland, still do switch off or at least be careful. And That's so very that, concrete now. So <laughs> your question really has to do with uh, the UK. Uh, but of course, you know, it may take so many years uh, before the negotiation process actually uh, takes shape uh, that uh, we'll have time to make even more progress uh, on the, uh, within the EU and I mean, the UK will still be part, so they will also take advantage of such progress starting 2018. So, uh, you wanted to react. You didn't. Yes, well, you do. Yes, go ahead. Let me Mr. just Viela. say that today, the 15th of June, is a good day for the UK, whether a citizen voted for Remain or not, they today have a free roaming. So, that's... Yeah, so uh, let's make sure they know about it, because that's I also... I think they, they realize it. No <laughs> fake news on that score. Um, again, thanks to our social media. And uh, So there is a question up there. Uh, but uh, uh, what will be the next EU digital success story? So that's, again, up to you, Roberto Viola. Geo-blocking. No geo-blocking. Geo no geo-blocking. No geo-blocking. <laughs> Sebastian? I think the next success story in Europe will not, be, will not come from any regulation. I'm sorry about <laughs> this. Uh, I, I think the, the success story is about tech, once again. Uh, I think that uh, the real issue is how do we have a playing field in Europe that gives it a chance to start up. So it deals with financial, with financing, and Mr. Vice President Ansip underline this, but I think it's also a question of mindset. The mindset of all the people that take decisions in, in countries and in Europe to be open to weak signals, to these new models, and not to, to, to think with the ancient models. That is why I react this way about the question of do we have too much operators in Europe? I, mm. I, I think the, the answer is no. But I think, more importantly, that this is not the good question. I think this question is not of very, very much importance. I think that this is not what will save Europe in, in the tech sector. It's not a very good question, but it is a question when it comes again to the capacity of these operators to invest uh, enough uh, to keep uh, up with the global competition, and uh, that's... Yeah. I, I understand the question, and, and on a theoretical point of view, I mean, this question is normal, but what we experience is quite simple. It's, and it's facts, I mean, it's not theory. It's that competition drives investment. And what we are seeing in France, for instance, because I'm, you know, I'm the chairman of ARCEP, which is the French telecom regulator, is that we are fostering competition, we are pushing operators to invest, and we have, in the same time, a fierce competition in the market, and we have the absolute record of investment in the telecom sector since two years. So this is fact. So I think that, once again, we have to focus on the real questions. OK, I'm looking now. It works. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the questions. It's all, you know, so many compliments that uh, is there any critical question of any kind? You know, I'm a journalist, so I'm always looking Can for something critical, I'm afraid. Yes, Can I just share yes. from the consumer perspective, waiting for your questions to arrive? Uh, we have also a proposal in the pipeline on uh, digital content services, which, we, which means that consumers will be better protected when they buy online digital content and digital services. This is also a very important step to have uh, consumer trust on the in, for the online market. So we are re welcome that very much. There's an interesting one. No message from my telco operator about roaming changes today. Is this bad or good news? <laughs> Ask Mr. Barroso. <laughs> no relation to 
the previous <laughs> president of the European Commission. Uh, we don't know who, I mean, <laughs> which telco operator he's using, so it's not, uh, so it's not really relevant. Uh, Christian Salbin, to, to get back to this idea, you know, w would the operators uh, actually respect uh, these rules or wouldn't respect these rules? Uh, wouldn't it be very foolish of them not to of do course. so? You know, it is a competitive market. If you're not happy, uh, with your provider, there are other providers out there who will be quite happy to to, uh, to get your business. So, you know, uh, that is the reality in the market. I think all operators want to keep, uh, uh, you know, mar markets in, in Europe are mature. I think uh, growth in the markets in, in, in Europe, uh, in most of the countries is now over. And it, there's a lot of churn, which is a technical term for customers moving from one to another. If you provide uncompetitive offers, in the market, either on the pricing or on the nature of the services that you provide, they will shift to others. And I totally agree with uh, Madame on the, my right about uh, the need to facilitate uh, moving from one operator to the other. There are also alternate uh, providers out there. You know, the, the, you cannot ignore the presence of uh, the over-the-top players, WhatsApps and all the others who are providing traditional telco uh, services that were not available except from traditional operators some years ago. So there's plenty there. That is, I think, the strongest incentive for all operators to behave. Madame Goyens, are you satisfied? Well, uh, in, well uh, as we agree that we need to improve the switching processes, uh, I think, yes, indeed, uh, it's a competitive market, but consumers do not necessarily have all the tools to vote with their feet. If that's facilitated, then it will be certainly something that will move also the market into the right direction. Mm -hmm. Roberto Viola, uh, just uh, not a conclusion, but just uh, to have a sort of uh, overview of what your uh, conclusion might be of this uh, discussion before we turn to the next one about the global uh, view and Europe in the world? Well, uh, my oral conclusion is that the mood, as you have seen, is very positive in the room and in the social media and the panel, because, I mean, let's not hide it during the years. I mean, uh, uh, it, all of uh, the panelists had uh, to defend certain positions, different points of view. So today we see convergence. Now, of course, the risk is to celebrate a bit too much, to drink a, a bottle of champagne too much tonight, which we have to do anyhow. Uh, <laughs> there are uh, even going to be fireworks. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we really now have to look very seriously on what we want for Europe in terms of uh, digital infrastructure. and. I mean, connectivity for our citizens. Our next big challenge, I mean, we have short-term challenge to complete this freedom of transaction without borders. Our best, next big challenge is every European must be connected to the internet, and no matter where it is, no matter whether it's rich or poor, and get good quality out of it. That's really, I'm sure that this is a, a, a goal for the parliament, it's a goal for all the presidencies, and it's a big goal for the European Commission and for Beric, of course. Thank you very much. Now, in case you all wonder who is this gentleman half hidden uh, behind his uh, tablet, uh, he's our artist cartoonist who uh, has been sketching and will continue to do so uh, all afternoon and also tomorrow. And so we will see the results. We all have, we all have our caricatures, I guess, uh, <laughs> which will be shown to us uh, sooner <laughs> or later. Uh, before I let you all go, um, uh, let me say a word about a photo contest which uh, uh, the EU uh, is launching today in order to celebrate uh, the 15th of June. Uh, photo contest, as indeed it doesn't cost anything to take a picture uh, and share uh, that picture uh, with your friends, family, uh, or whatever. So, uh, take pictures of your best holiday moments, assuming you, you were on holidays, and 
Uh, if you win, uh, you'll get an interrail ticket to travel across the EU in any train, notwithstanding the fact that all trains are not equipped with <laughs> the proper <laughs> Wi-Fi uh, system. So, uh, to join the roaming EU photo contest, you send a picture, I'm just reading this, with a short description via messenger to digital single market Facebook page. The Commission uploads your picture uh, in a specific uh, contest photo gallery, and then you will ask your friends to like or dislike your picture, and the three pictures with the highest number of likes wins. That will end on the 15th of September, and the winners will be announced shortly afterwards. Thank you very much to you all. A big applause to you. Uh, and. Uh, please remain seated. You will see a short trailers of some videos uh, that were selected. We'll talk more about these videos uh, tomorrow morning, and uh, you'll have a, a taste of those, and then we'll continue with our next panel. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. The public will be reconnected to the political process and the digital world will be a place for every citizen thanks to the interactivity, affordability, availability and connectivity of the internet. The social media platforms have huge implications.